Knock, knock. Hi, Mrs. Green. My name's Rachel. I'll be your nurse this morning. Mm. How are you feeling? I'm, I'm fine. Are you okay? Yeah. What's brought you into hospital today, Mrs. Gray? I don't know. Jenny brought me. Is Jenny your daughter? Yes. Jenny's here. She is. She's just outside. Okay. So delirium refers to acute confusion of state with reduced attention and reduced awareness of the surroundings. It's probably more common than we think. It affects about 10% to 40% of older patients requiring surgery. In the intensive care unit setting, the figure is probably higher. It can affect up to half of the patients of all ages. Now, Mrs Green, can you tell me your full name? Um, it's, it's Angela. Angela. And your surname? Well, Green. 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 Yeah. Green. Green. You call me Mrs Green. I did. Just testing you. <laughs> okay. And your date of birth, my dear? Um, the 12th of July. Yeah, 1958. How old does that make you now, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, I don't know. Do you know what year it is, Mrs Green? Um, 19, um, um, 1995. 2016. Oh. Yeah, it's the 20th of April 2016 today. Oh, gosh. It is important for health professional to recognise delirium, as delirium is a fairly common but serious uh, complication. It can lead to uh, both short and long-term consequences. These consequences will include increased hospital length of stay, increased morbidity and mortality rates, and reduced functional recovery, leading to certain older patients requiring admission to residential care facility. We know if a patient has delirium, um, their relative risk of mortality is increased by around 40% um, on that hospitalisation compared to a similar patient who doesn't have delirium. And the risk of being discharged to an institution rather than back home is increased twofold, 200%. So they're, they're serious, it's a serious medical emergency um, which carries with it serious risks of death and harm. But I think more important than that is the uh, when you speak to patients after they've had delirium is the distress it's caused them and caused their family to see this person who's acutely changed in their behaviour or their perception or their cognition. Um, patients tend to describe this fog that they've been in where there's a very distressing, frightening experience of sort of knowing something's wrong with them but not being able to, you know, um, make that better and make it make that better for themselves and their distress and the distress of their relatives is, is very uh, very powerful when you talk to those people. Hi Brendan, I was wondering if you'd, if you'd have seen Mrs Green this morning. No I haven't. She's a 58 year old uh, lady who came into emergency department with a chest infection. Mm -hmm. um, she's just scoring poorly on her AMT, scoring two out of four, not mm -hmm. orientated to time or to place. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could review her please. Definitely. There are a few features that could differentiate um, the illness of delirium and dementia. Uh, in general, uh, patients with delirium tend to have an acute onset, uh, they tend to demonstrate features of inattention and they tend to have a fluctuating course even uh, in a period of a day. Conversely, in patients with dementia, the onset tends to be progressive, particularly in patients with the Alzheimer's dementia subtype. Uh, inattention and fluctuating course tends not to be a prominent feature in patients with dementia. Have, ha, however, acknowledging that both features can be present uh, in uh, both illness and it can be sometimes difficult to differentiate between both of them. So we like to think of delirium really as there's two components to it. One is the insult that sort of precipitates the delirium and the other are the predisposing risk factors to develop delirium. So in actual fact, we're all at risk of getting delirium if the insult is large enough. You may have no predisposing risk factors, but a very large insult can cause delirium in anyone. But more commonly, we see patients with predisposition to delirium that develop delirium in the ED setting. And, and they are people with pre-existing cognitive impairment, uh, older people, people um, who are on multiple medications or have multiple medical, medical comorbidities. That group of people 
may need a relatively minor, trivial insult um, to precipitate delirium in their situation. Or sometimes we may not even find the cause of the delirium, but we know that something's changed, a urine infection or change in medication or something has changed that's, that's, that's caused delirium to develop. My name's Amanda, I'm one of the occupational therapists here. I just want to ask you a couple of questions just to see how your thinking is going, if that's okay it's, with it's you. It's fine. We've got a few questions and we'll see how you go. Can you tell me where we are at the moment? Well, we're, we're here. And where is here? Well, we're here. Do you know what the name of this building is? Where are we? Okay, we're in the hospital. This is Fiona Stanley Hospital. And can you tell me what date it is today? Um, it's December. Okay, and do you know what year it is? Oh, it's um, um, 1995, um, yeah. Okay. It's actually April in 2016, Mrs Green, but that's all right. Now, just another thing, if you could do for me, could you count from 20 back to zero? Um, what now? Yes, please. Um, 20? Mm -hmm. um, 18? Um, 12? Can you keep going? What? Thank you very much for trying that, Mrs Green. The features of the delirium include acute onset, fluctuating course, features of inattention, features of disorganised thinking and altered level of consciousness. Based on the clinical assessment of the patient, you can then complete the confusion assessment method form to assist with the diagnosis of delirium. Hi Rachel, uh, I've seen uh, Mrs Green on the ward. Uh, she's come in with a bout of chest infection and I think she's got complications of delirium as well. So I think we should offer her good non-pharmacological strategies to manage her delirium. And I'll start off by uh, in ensuring that she has adequate oral hydration and maintaining a good urinary and bowel care as well. Do you have any other suggestions? I think we should involve the family in her care and um, provide diversional therapy to manage her agitation. I'm going to go make her a cup of tea. Do you mind calling the family? No problems, I can Thank do that. You. So a health professional can diagnose delirium uh, based on a good clinical assessment. And clinical as good clinical assessment would involve, firstly, a good medical assessment of the patient. Secondly, uh, involving nursing staff and allied health staff in gathering collateral history and functional assessment of the patient. And thirdly, gathering information from family members and carers to establish their baseline function. Information from this assessment will provide us with information uh, to further support the diagnosis based on features of delirium. I would manage delirium by firstly identifying what the cause was liaising with your medical teams and multidisciplinary teams. I would then treat that underlying cause. I would do this by reorientating your patient, by using orientation techniques such as clocks, calendars and orientation boards, engaging with carers and others, trying to find out what the patient likes, getting them to stay with the patient. Hello Angela. I'm Peter. I'm one of the nurses who work here at the hospital. Just take a quick set of OBS. Thank you very much. Um, now I've had a look at your blood results and it shows that your kidney function is a little bit off which can indicate that you're a bit dehydrated or a bit dry. So what we need you to do this morning is drink as much water as possible. Does that sound okay? Water. Yep. I'll get the nurses to get you some now, alright? Okay. okay. I would then ensure that we documented to see any triggers, so using a behavioural management chart, area, area specific. And then we could see what triggers cause a patient to become agitated. For diversional therapies, I would start use, finding out what the patient likes, looking at their history, what they did for occupation, what hobbies they enjoyed. So if they like knitting, providing them with knitting needles. 
it is an individual needs basis, so every patient is different what they like. Here we are, Angela. My name's Peter. What are you doing? What's, what's that? Remember, I'm the nurse here looking after you. The doctor would like you to drink a lot more water because it's been a couple of hours now and I haven't seen you drink any water. This is some water. You've been here for a couple of hours now. Jenny brought you in mm. a few hours ago. Jenny. She's in the next room. She's talking to the doctor now. Uh. If you could drink a whole glass of water, that would be, that would be good. So what health professionals should do when managing a patient with delirium is not just assume it's a natural progression of a disease such as dementia. So it's important that we actually identify that delirium. We then want to treat the patient by using strategies such as sensory, so ensure adequate lighting and heating and cooling because if that patient is cold, they're going to be more agitated. Reorientating the patient to the area, so avoid using room changes and area changes if possible. So using calendars and clocks is a really good way of reorientating your patient. Ensuring that they have foods that they like and fluids that they like because if they don't like it, they're not going to want it anyway. So having it nearby and things that they like is important. So talking with your patient, smiling, clearly and concise and identifying yourself is really important. Providing them with adequate pain relief is really important because if they're in pain, they're going to become more agitated. However, observing what triggers that patient, is there something that they're having that's causing them to become increasingly confused? Hello again, Mrs. Green. It's Karina. I'm the doctor. You're the doctor? I am. So I've just had a chat to your lovely daughter, Jenny. Jenny, here. She is. She's just in the next room, so she'll be coming in in a it's... moment. Oh. Okay. So after having a chat with her, it seems like you're a little bit more confused than normal. Yep. Sometimes that can be a sign of an infection. So what we need to do is do some more investigations to find out where that infection's coming from. Does that sound okay? Okay. Okay. So you'll just be with you're us. You're the doctor. I am. You'll just be with us for a little bit longer. Okay, I'm just going to have a quick chat to your nurse. Um, I just wanted to let you know, Peter, um, I've had a chat to the daughter, obviously. Um, if we could get a companion for Angela, because I think that um, she's quite delirious at the moment. Um, if we could also get a recording. What's going on? It's okay, my dear. An intake chart and a behavioural chart as well. That would be great. Certainly. Thank you. We just... Who are you? I'm Peter. I'm the nurse. I'm going to organise a companion nurse for you. It'll just be another nurse who's in the room and looking after you. You're a you. nurse? I'm a nurse, yes. So either myself or the other nurse will be here in the room all the time. If you could drink the rest of that water. Now, I'll be going, but I'll be back shortly after I collect some paperwork. Things you want to avoid is arguing with the patient. So you want to step back if they're not at risk to themselves or others and come back later. You don't want to put them in an environment that is overstimulated. So not too much loud noise, not too bright a lighting, but also not dim. You want to assess a patient individually as well because sometimes having no stimulus can actually cause a patient to become more agitated. Avoiding room clutter because if there's something nearby and they are agitated, they can actually use that as um, a potential weapon. Standing side on to the patient in a non-threatening manner and always identifying yourself and others. We need to be very careful with certain strong painkillers like opioids or medications used for the treatment of uh, nerve pain like anticholinergic drugs or antidepressants. Some sleeping or anti-anxiety medications can trigger delirium if we stop it suddenly. Any recent changes with medications can potentially trigger delirium. Family members and GPs are good sources of the information. If in doubt, a pharmacist will be able to perform medication regimen review to determine if it is drug related. Okay, when should we consider pharmacological management, chemical restraint? Well, after everything else is in place. Once the environment and the psychological approach to the patient and their medical management's right, um, and the physical state's as good as it can be, 
and the agitation is still continuing. We've got a one-to-one -one special if that's needed and someone's or family members present and the patient's still agitated. Only then should we consider prescribing. The reason for being so reluctant to prescribe is it doesn't usually help. It's really a very weak intervention and, and it can so easily make things worse if we get it wrong. So we should have low expectations from medications. I think that's one of the problems. People think it's going to solve the problem. It doesn't usually and it can even make it worse. The least harmful approach and the most likely to succeed is to avoid sedation altogether, so avoid benzodiazepines, and instead use a low dose of a high potency antipsychotic. If the patient's frail and elderly, something like uh, 0.5 or 1 milligram of risperidone, or maybe haloperidol if it needs to be injected, um, 0.5 or 1 milligram, and then that could be repeated after an hour or two. But that's it. If that doesn't work, don't proceed any further that night with medications. Instead, rely on the non-pharmacological intervention. The thing is, the law actually protects us and gives us a lot of discretion. There's this thing called the doctrine of necessity, which is basically what we often mean when we say duty of care. It means that if we think a patient's life or limb is in danger, and we can see this, uh, there, that we should be acting coercively to prevent that, and we're not able to get informed consent from the patient. If we don't believe the patient is actually able to give informed consent or we can't communicate with them, we, we have the um, legal right to to um, keep someone in hospital, to detain them, to uh, proceed in a, in a way that would be within normal clinical realm, you know, normal cl clinical scope, um, so long as we were acting in good faith and we thought we were doing the right thing at the time. We also have to document the reasoning, um, particularly documenting the harm that we are trying to prevent. If we'd done that, we were very, very unlikely to ever be criticised in a legal forum, either common law or the civil law, for acting coercively to protect a patient. Hi there. I'm one of the physiotherapists that's been working in there. Is that one of your family members? Yeah, that's my mum, Ange. Yeah, okay. I've spoken to, I think, is it your sister then, previously? Uh, Jenny, yeah. yeah. Uh, look, she's gone to the shops. Yep, yeah. okay, no worries. Well, I, I can give you an update on how she's been going, if you like. Oh, how's she going? So she's not so good at the moment. She seems to be really confused and also in a lot of pain. So we weren't able to even really get much further than sitting on the edge of the bed. And she seemed to be in too much pain to do more than that. Is that usual for her? Uh, well, she's normally got a bit of back pain, yeah. but she's got um, surgery for her back next month. Okay. So Look, she struggles. Yep. We have an increase of pain medication at home, but okay. she's normally okay. All right, so it sounds like it's a bit different at the moment. The pain seems a bit more significant. The pain medication is something that the medical team will be looking at to make sure she's getting the right amount. Did you have any other concerns with her at the moment? Mainly just the confusion. Mm. She's normally really switched on. I'm yep. just sort of worried why that's happening. Okay, well, we've got um, social worker service uh, in this hospital. So hopefully we'll get one of them to have a chat to you if you'd, if you'd like that, to talk about some services and other options they might be able to help out with. Yeah, yeah. look, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. All right, no worries, cheers. Hi Colin, I'm Mel, I'm a social worker. Oh, hi Mel, nice to meet you. How are you doing? Um, look, to be honest, I'm worried about mum. She's yeah. confused and in pain. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just worried how, how she's going to manage when she gets back home. I guess I have to wait for this confusion to resolve. How is she usually when she's at home? Uh, look, I help with the shopping and the heavy lifting. Otherwise mum's pretty independent. She, um, I think the word is fiercely independent. Okay, yeah, sure. sure. And does she have any services in place or anything at home? Uh, just me. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So she hasn't really needed any of nah, that not at all. support before. Okay. Yeah. So from what it sounds like, she's usually pretty independent at home. Um, at the moment, like the physio would have mentioned, she's quite confused and not really able to get up um, due to her pain. Oh, that's right. Look, um, she's also got some bills to be paid this week. Her rent's due. 
Um, my sister Jen mentioned something about an enduring power of attorney and okay. if I could speak to you about it. Do you know if your mum's signed an enduring power of attorney before? Nah, no need. She's normally quite fine. Okay, sure. Yep. Um, well, what I'll do is I'll speak to the team about that um, because signing endu an enduring power of attorney is like signing a legal document um, and she has to be of sound mind to be able to do that. Um, given her current confusion at the moment, we'd just be a bit concerned whether she is able to to, to sign anything right now. Um, so I'll speak to the team and um, see if there's anything we can do about this confusion that she's got at the moment. Um, in the meantime, is it possible for family to help out with paying her bills? Of course, she's my mum. Sure, great. Okay, no worries. Well, I'll speak to the team about that, okay? Cool. So my three key messages are, firstly, if someone's acting in a difficult way and, and it's hard to gain their cooperation, Think about capacity. Think about whether they're actually cognitively impaired in some way and whether that's interfering with their decision-making ability. The second thing is, um, if someone is obviously impaired, then act protectively. Don't be scared to act protectively. Don't be scared to limit their rights and treat them coercively if you think that's the right thing to do. If you honestly believe that's the right thing to do, the law will protect you and you're not really in any danger of being um, criticised or sued for doing what you believe at the time to be the right thing. The third thing is, if you're in doubt, escalate. Ask for um, assistance from a psychiatrist or through the social worker, get advice from the Office of the Public Advocate. Hi, Dr. Oh, Benner. No. Hi, I just wanted to come speak to you about uh, Mrs. Angela Green. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to. Um, discuss with you. She's been a bit confused for the last couple of days and I've just gone in and spoken to her son mm -hmm. and he's really quite concerned about her confusion at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's asked, um, she's got a lot of bills to pay at the moment and he's asked if she's able to sign an enduring power of attorney. Right. What do you think about that? I mean, it sounds like she's quite confused, probably too confused to be signing any legal documents, I would have thought. Yeah, I'd, that would be my impression yeah. at the moment. Is there she anything sounds... worrying about the way she was before, like before she came in? Was, well, was she managing on her own okay? Well, no, it sounds like um, from what the son has said, she's usually very independent, mm -hmm. um, no previous concerns about her memory or cognition. Okay. Um, she, she lives alone but doesn't need any services or supports at home. Right. Um, so this is quite new for her. Right. So it sounds like the medical team will be looking for all the various factors that might be contributing to her confusion but the prognosis is actually very good. In the meantime it's just a matter of managing her and keeping her as well as possible and, and, and keeping the family well informed. So yeah I'm very happy to have a chat to the family. Great. Right. Okay thank you.